Hello guys, today we are kicking off 3D session with Federico Valla where we are going to build 3D store in Webflow. This is going to be series of three videos. So first part where we do the initial setup, when we bring the model, we prepare the model in Blender and we bring to Webflow. Second part where we build infrastructure for the build inside of the Webflow and we're gonna use an earlier library, we're gonna use plugin that allows you to bring components and stuff from Figma to Webflow. And the third build is where we bring everything together. So it's gonna be fully CMS controlled web store where you can turn sync around in 3D and explore the products in 3D space. Today with us Federico Walla, as always, it's our pleasure to have you here. Yes, thank you, Sergey. Thank you for having me again. Uh, in this episode, we're going to specifically be starting this amazing project together. And I think the main focus, other than setting it up and setting up the whole structure, is going to be on how to prepare 3D models, how to, and how are we actually going to leverage all the tools that Blender gives us and that are also tools that are in 3JS then in browser to make the most out of the UV systems and to be able to have as much control as possible in browser when getting our textures. That's sweet. What you see on the screen is a mockup, uh, which is done in Figma. And uh, Patrico, you can show like if you, if you click on details, it's open details. Like here is like when you browse through different stuff, like, you know, uh, t-shirt or Mac or cap, and then you want this art on the t-shirt. Uh, so you go to details and you purchase this one, but for browsing, uh, you can switch between objects. So this is like main concept. You can rotate, you can zoom pan, like you would do with any model and you can export the art from different angles and like, you know, we're still going crazy, like uh, doing some AR stuff where you can just like literally try it on yourself. You know, we're not going to go here. I'm pretty sure this is the future of, uh, of stores, like of e-commerce, uh, in future. So people can really uh, feel this so I can see it. Uh, but what we're gonna do is just like people see it from different angles. And when you hover over this bros art, it means that you, let's say you're you have a t-shirt and then on bros art, uh, on hover, you see like different versions of prints available for these t-shirts. And we actually really wanted to build it for a while, exactly, uh, you know, this 3D store. And we are going to implement this on a real actual pins with store. So right now we have 2D experience, but uh, after this series, we're going to implement all of this that we have built uh, live here for you guys. We're going to implement it to Fins with uh, official merge. Uh, I think if we look at the, and I'm mostly focusing on the model right now, if you actually look at it, uh, we're going to have a shirt. We're also going to have a, a mug and a baseball cap. And ideally, we build it in a way and with a system that is going to allow us and, and also the people who actually clone this or that follow along to implement the same store with every type of 3D model and uh, with every type of textures and so on, because it's going to be all dynamic. So the, 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 the prints and the texture are actually going to be taken from uh, the Webflow uh, e-commerce, uh, how do you say it, the Webflow e-commerce images. And we're going to find a way to prepare the model uh, so it's going to be uh, convenient. So if you add another model and you add a corresponding product in the Webflow e-commerce side of things, the model is going to be automatically added to this kind of rotation or switcher. So I think the start, as always, we start with the models. So I'm going to open Blender. What I did this morning in preparation for this is to find a few model that could work for this. So this shirt model, actually, we had laying around for a long, long, long time, Sergey. was like, was the original one. I didn't actually have it, uh, but I found the same model. So this is a nice 
thing. <laughs> so what I was looking for was for models that were reasonable in terms of the number of polygons. I think especially for clothes and for this kind of stuff, you're going to need to go for a little bit more polygons if you want to see all the wrinkles and, and actually the, the clothing item flows. <clears throat> I found a baseball cap, gigantic. This is even, this is probably a, a more, more lower resolution. Again, this model we will be able to swap and the preparation that we're doing on this model can be done on every model, even if it has more polygons, less polygon and so on. I just found all of those on Sketchfab and I think we're also going to be giving credits to the, to the artists who made them originally. I think I can also share uh, basically a collection on a Sketchfab that has the models that we're going to be using. And if I think some of those might be updated, I think this is not the correct cap type, but just for reference and to have something we, we, we will be using this today. So we, we can try to exactly. generate models, uh, with AI, uh, you know, like in spline, they allow now to generate, um, 3D models, if you just like describe them correctly. <laughs> yeah, uh, right. I tried image, like text to image, great. Text to 3D model for me is still a little bit behind. But I think we're eventually going to get there. Nice. So this is like the model, how they actually came. What I did is just download them from Sketchfab in the best format I could find. There were like some GLTF. No, there were probably a couple of SVG and one was actually already in Blender. So I just imported them and organized them. You're probably not going to see this part, but I organized them just to have them conveniently uh, toggleable on and off uh, in uh, the Blender viewport. Now, there's three models. There's a shot, a cap, and a mug. And I think everyone might be asking, where's the mug? <laughs> because the mug is it's really, 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 really small compared to this. And this is the first type of optimization. And... Uh, things we want to do. Ideally, we want the browser to do the smallest amount of work possible. So when you prepare the model, one of the first things you should do is resize everything according to what your final scale would be. And if you look at the, like, this is, those models are obviously not going to be in real scale in terms of the mag is going to be displayed in a size that's sim more similar to the shirt than, um, than it, like, if it was scaled in real units, it would be too small and probably in the center. So what we are going to do is have all the different models match a rough scale uh, that we arbitrarily define as a one unit. So the issue is, it's not really the mug that's particularly small, but is, uh, well, the mug is particularly small. The, um, the cap and the shirts are gigantic. So what I do is, I'm going to take this shirt. The dimension is 23 by 10 by 24. So this is definitely a really large shirt. So I'm just going to scale it and make it into more. This is one by 2.38 by 2.46. Again, we're not going for real dimension. Ideally, what I want to do is the largest, tallest. In this case, it's going to be the tallest to be around one meter. So I still have to do a 0.5-ish. So this is now 1.9, 1.19, 0 0.5 by 0.23 in the vertical axis. This is roughly a good size in terms of, especially in terms of handling real-time lights, because lights are actually have an impact on, like size of the thing actually has an impact on how, how light works, also in 3JS. And this time you're going to see also a little bit of real-time lightning in browser. So... You scale this, and a really important thing you have to do is to hit Command A and apply. Uh, in this case, is scale. So this because if you don't do this, you don't apply the scale. The transformation is only existing in Blender, and it's not going to exist when you export it out. So it's really important to always remember to apply the scale and actually to apply all the transforms. So now we have the shirt sized correct way. We do the same thing for the cap. So this is, uh, this is going to be like, again, if, if you think about how it could work in browser, those are kind of the correct sizes, I'd say, in terms of, uh, they're going to display nice and in the same range of space. So again, you click on the cap, control A, you apply 
I'd, I'd suggest always applying all transforms if you're in doubt. So then there's the mag. The mag is, is gone to the side. We bring it back to the origin. And again, you can see the mag being a bit smaller. So th this is going to instead be scaled a little bit larger. And I think this is a size that's going to allow us to work good with that. We apply all transforms and so on. So we actually have all three of the models now in Blender. Uh, you're going to be able to adjust this uh, even further later. And so you don't really need to worry too much about it and also the base positions and stuff. But in general, the first thing you want to do is to have them scaled as um, as consistently as possible from the start. We, we will be able eventually to, to mess with the scale a little bit even live, but it's better if you can do it in another moment. Another important thing is the origin. The origin is this point here. And the origin point is the is the pivot point of the object. So this is also nice if we wanted to animate and make it like float and spin a little bit and so on to make sure to have the origin in the correct place. You can modify the origin by selecting all the point, going to edit mode uh, with tab, selecting all the vertices and moving it. So if you're moving something when you're in edit mode, you're going to actually move it and not move the origin. So this is just a tip. You, you're going to find tutorial that explain all this stuff better than me. Just know that you want your origin to be in the center. And you probably will want your model to be exported from the same model and to be able to most to be to be able to control them in browser as best as possible and actually position them yourself rather than having them positioned in blend. But this is not uh, too important for now. So I think we we can start somewhere and like this is a good start. We have our models, we have them in Blender, they are zeroed, they have transforms and everything is applied. Uh, the next thing we'll need to talk about are UVs. Now UVs are an extremely large um, discussion point, but UVs are basically a version of the mesh that's laid out in two dimensions, so it's actually flat. And UVs are what the texture needs to know to know how it's going to be applied. So it's basically a map for the texture to know where it goes. Because if you think about it, if you just make this model flat and like you unroll all the surfaces of it, and then you paint on top of it, you're going to actually be able to understand and know where all the pieces of that drawing, which ultimately is a texture, are going to land uh, on top of the model. So in Blender on the top, you're going to have um, a layout called UV editing. And UV editing is uh, a view where you can look at your model, but on the left, you have exactly this flat uh, representation of the model. So if you tab into uh, edit mode, again, is the tab key or you can go up top right where there's object mode, you can click edit mode. Uh, let's just remove this image. So this is a UV layout and these are all of the points of our mesh in 3D space. So for example, if we select the front of this texture, what you're gonna see is like, this is gonna be a bit messy because there's more sides and things like that, but don't worry about this. So ideally the UVs are a flat representation of how a texture when applied onto this image is going to look like. And I think uh, before taking this further, I think it might make sense to jump briefly into the code and implement those models and load those models into Webflow and actually see how the UVs match between Blender and Webflow. In Webflow CMS, we're going to have different images, like different prints, right? And we want to show those prints on a t-shirt. So this is like CMS items. They contain images, art, or that can be logo, that can be art, that can be whatever, like on front and back of the image on the uh, sleeve. So some art. And we want to be able to take that image from the CMS item and place it directly on a t-shirt. So if you build it for a client, the client can just like manage any art on a t-shirt just from CMS items. So they can take the CMS, 
put it in a t-shirt and like uh, users who would just like visit uh, and see those like t-shirts, they will see it on a t-shirt. Uh, and same for others, uh, for, for other objects. So this is kind of like the main goal of um, of all of this. Yeah, exactly. In that case, they're going to be extremely important to use as a concept in general, because we, we're going to need to place graphics in fairly specific ways, but we don't want to upload a lot of different images for all this kind of stuff. So we're going to leverage the UVs and actually don't use UVs in a traditional way. Use them more in a we're going to leverage them to the maximum and actually make UVs custom for us to be able to place graphic with extreme precision. So I think we can get to, so right now, just for the sake of uh, trying this out, my suggestion would be, let's start with a shirt. Uh, if we want just to start with a shirt and yeah. again, be aware, we, we don't have done anything with UV. These are pretty nice UVs in general, in terms of, this come from uh, someone that knew what he was modeling. But uh, so what we'll do is go to file. Same thing we did the last time. So we export the GLTF. We save it on the desktop. I have a folder called rocks. Uh, my suggestion is, again, set yourself up to make your life as easy as possible. So you can tick remember export settings. Uh, so you're going to have consistent export and you're going to be able to iterate on models really fast. You're going to, you want to have the GLTF binary as a format for now, at least. And in the include tab, uh, my suggestion is let's get to limit to selected objects. So right now we're, we're not exporting the whole scene, but we're only exporting the shirt because we're going to need to do a little bit of setup to get the model working in browser. So you export the GLTF two on desktop. Uh, you're going to rename that to .txt. I already done this, so we don't have to uh, show the, again, it is the same thing we did last time with the robot. You rename that to the TXT, it jumped into Webflow, and in the assets panel, you're going to have, I, I'm using, like this Webflow project at the moment is the same project we were using last time. So there's still a robot in here. And I'm gonna show you why there's still a robot, but I also have a store, we should make uh, the robot wearing t-shirt now, uh, keeping Mac, we, you know, wearing hat. <laughs> so we have a, the store 3D glb.txt. So I renamed this, dragged into the assets panel and I need to get the link and I will publish it. I think it should be already published it, but we, we are exactly where we were last time. So it's a whole black screen because we're not having our code editor working at the moment. I need to open it from here. So just a bit of a refresher. We have a we have a div which has an attribute called data-3d equals C, and we have a little bit of styling that make that uh fixed full screen. And just so we're gonna be able to put the canvas inside this with the same parameters. So we're gonna see the project full screen and our 3D project basically. So right now we actually have this canvas if you inspect it. I'm gonna make it a bit larger. If you inspect it, that's this div, but nothing is happening in here. Let's do to code. So it's VS code. This is again, same file from last time. You can find this in GitHub, or if you followed along, you should have a file that looks roughly like this. And same thing as last time, we'll need to get into this file. <clears throat> now I have a, a test version as I tried it a little bit earlier. Uh, and what we want to do, uh, again, as mm, if you look at the package JSON, there's the scripts. Now, once again, building on top of Alex's amazing work, we have a dev script. And this is Finsweet Developer Starter again. So what we want to do is in the <coughs> terminal run PN PNPM dev. And if we hit this, we're going to get our script and a convenient script tag. Again, thank you, Alex. Uh, and what you should do with this script tag is, if you don't have it, this is again, the same project as last time, you just put it in the before closing body tag. So it happens after the page is actually there. And this is gonna come in handy later on more than anything, when you're gonna have to select things from the DOM, so they need to be there. But again, yes, this is the script. 
we have the script. So if we save this, and right now, since we are having our script running, means that this code is being served. And if we go to the published version, hopefully, we're going to see our old friend robot. This is our old project of the robot. And we're actually going to use the same code to do what we are doing this time, or at least the basics. Because a really important thing, especially when you start building this type of complex code heavy project is if you have to retype every piece of the code every time, those projects are going to become unmanageable basically. But if you can reuse as much as possible from the code, you realize you're going to keep on like some function you're going to use every time and they're just going to work. So we are being recycling some code. So last time in the source file, what we did, we, we were waiting for the Webflow function to uh, trigger our init 3D function. In the 3D function, this is going to be a really fast uh, recap. Y you have that on the YouTube channel, I think, does the previous um, sessions. So you can see when we build this. We had a session with Federico where we have brought those like 3D robots into uh, Webflow. And we explained step by step how to host this model in Webflow and how to bring the model from Blender to Webflow. So just go and watch that uh, and you will fully understand how to do this. Please keep it going. We have a function that it eats the 3D. We select the viewport of the thing we gave the attribute earlier on. There's a scene, a camera, and a render. I think we, we talked extensively about those. We set size, we do some things, we add the controls, which is the thing that allow us to click and drag around. These are also quite useful. Even if you're not planning on using that in your application, it's useful to debug and actually look at where things go and so on. We position the camera a little bit back. Uh, then there's some things that we're not really gonna use because these are about the bones that we use to have the robot look around following your mouse. So, we are declaring the mouse. Again, this we might end up keeping. There's the event listener for mouse move. There's a function that runs every frame that we're using to animate stuff. This we're going to probably keep. And this is going to be the place where we load the assets. So this is the URL for a robot. Uh, but now we want to load something different. So we want to load something different, which is our shirt. Um, our shirt mm. model. So we get the new link, we delete the old one, and we paste the shirt model. Now, something strange is going to happen most likely since, yeah. So does an animation mixer because we were animating the model. So what we need to do is go and find the mm, where the animation mixer was initialized and simply delete that. So we don't have a mixer, we don't have an action, we don't have all these things that we were using for um, to do the animation. And now we see something really strange. Uh, something really strange is the texture from the robot applied to a really large shirt. Yes. Now, why is it a really large shirt? It's a really large shirt because when I exported the model when testing it out, so when I previously did the export, I wasn't actually doing what I preach and I haven't resized the model to test it. So this is why every time you load, this shirt is going to be gigantic. We're going to address this in a minute because we're going to do a fresh export soon. And just for now, a good way to do it. So the, the three model is going to be in the center and the camera is actually right now at three units back. We just make it a really large number and but again this is not going to play nice with lights because everything is going to be out of scale but for now this is going to be good to just see a really strange shirt with the texture map mapped to the robot so the texture map is wrong for sure and uh but also we need to load a different texture so just for test i've also uploaded print a print um, texture. This is just a black and white texture with, uh, can I? So this is just a black and white rectangle with some text in black. And this is 
going to be kind of important. So the text needs to be black and there's white behind. But uh, for now, just know this is the texture we're going to use. And those textures are the ones that are going to eventually be pulled from the e-commerce side of things. So all the prints that you're going to apply on the work are going to come from the e-commerce. So we're going to select them from the data that Webflow provides. For now, just to test it, we will switch the robot texture to use this. And now we're going to see something even worse. We're going to see, well, it's not even worse. It's, no, it's cool. It's kind of like Prince with style. I like it, yeah. We're making some progress. This is actually a nice, like it, it could definitely be a, a trendy shirt at this point. And right. with, with, contemp with contemporary fashion, but um, so building a texture that, that's obviously not what, like it's not doing exactly what we want, but we are getting somewhere. Now, one thing that if not with using shaders, and I think we will, will eventually keep shaders as a final lesson or, or of a series of its own. So in, in, in an attempt to do it in an easy and manageable way for everyone that's following without getting into a whole different programming language, uh, what we'll need to do is we, we're not going to have enough textures and play to manually do lights and shadows. So we're going to delegate some of this work to 3JS because it has a pretty nice system. So what we want to do, the first thing we want to do Last time we were using a so-called mesh basic material. The mesh basic material, as you can see in the rendered version in the thing in browser, it just looks extremely plain and like flat. So we definitely don't want that. We want some shadows, otherwise things look really bad. You can do them by baking them as we did for the robot, or you can do them by adding lights to your 3JS scene. How do we add lights? So after all of our things in the function animate, we should add a function that's called add light. Thank you, Copilot. And he's going to add, I want also an environment. No, I want an environment light. Uh, const and the light. That's perfect. But I think we might want to call this ambient light. Uh, so we add an ambient light, and then we're also going to add uh, let's do a directional light. This is crazy. Thank you, Copilot, again. So 3JS provides to us by default. Now, I think we should do a point light, though. Well, let's start with the ambient light, and we'll eventually uh, add more. So as per everything else that you're doing in uh, 3JS, you want to add everything, every object, every everything you do to the scene. And the last thing is to actually call this function to make sure something happens. Now, having done that, you might notice that nothing has changed. And this is because the material that we were using, so the mesh basic material, doesn't respond to light. It just shows a flat image and that's it. So 3JS provides a different material that's called mesh standard material. And again, just for reference, the documentation is really good. And if you have any doubts on, like, this is the mesh standard material. So you can see there's some lights in this. And at the same time, the mesh basic material, as you can see, is pure flat and is what we have at the moment. So don't be afraid of referencing the documentation. So now something is happening. It's not too clear and lights are pretty bad, but just for reference, if we were not to add the ambient light, we would not be able to see anything just because the object is there, but you cannot see it because it's not illuminated. And we're using a material that needs illumination to actually display. So this lighting is pretty boring though. Well, this is not even lightning. We still call the function. Uh, this lighting is pretty boring. What we want to do is to, like this is an ambient light. This means from every point in space, light is coming out and going in every, di in every direction. So everything is plain illumination. But it's really useful if you want to do, to give yourself a base point to start illuminating things. It's kind of diffuse lightning. What we want to, to 
see a bit better. Right, you want me to do a directional light. So if we add a directional light, we also need, yeah. Now we're gonna see way more shadows and things. Now the position is a bit boring for now and, and our texture is completely white, which doesn't complement it really that much, but it's a start. Like we, we're actually starting to illuminate this thing in a way that's a bit more interesting. There's other lights in 3 Yes, my, if you have to use them, I think a directional light is really good. Directional light means you take the light, you set its position. So these are X, X, Y, and Z axis. So this is the horizontal one. This is the, uh, let's call it depth one. No, sorry, vertical one. And this is the uh, depth. So this light is actually just pulled a little bit towards us. Another thing we could do is those two parameters, one is the color, the second one is the intensity. So if, if we diminish a little bit the intensity of this, and you make the intensity of this a bit higher, we should see, well, with with this uh, type of setup, with, with the pure white, you, it's not really gonna be that clear, but we can control all of those lights and we're gonna get a bit deeper later on when we actually look at what we want to do with this scene for now. Just know that if we're using a different material, we need some lights and we need some control over those. So if we want to the light from the side uh, to just highlight, um, you know, all the yeah, so this material better, how to do it? So zero, 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 the light is going to be basically inside of here. Mm -hmm. So it is, is exactly where the shirt is. So if you move it by one in the X axis, which is the horizontal axis, you're going to see that the right being exactly in line with this, but like, see that's illuminated so like fully towards the left. And this is kind of a nice lighting setup, like having a couple of lights coming in from the side. So you're basically going to have all the lights nice. on one side, no light on the other. A good position in general to position light is like, you give it a little bit of right. And I to, to mimic a more realistic setup is a bit, a bit higher. Like this is top right light. So the light is coming from here, getting down here. And another thing that might help a bit is to do a lead, like pull it a little bit more close to us. So it, it actually illuminates going down to the, mm, to the object. Now, this is good. There's a couple of other things that are going to the more advanced 3 guess that we we'll need. So when we declare the render, the renderer, we also want to, we can pass it parameters. So the first thing I want to do in general is alpha, means we're gonna allow our scene to have transparent things. And this we're gonna need because we want to place our print, but we also want to be able to control the color of the rest of the shirt. So we actually need the transparency. And another thing is the anti-alias. Means this is just a, a thing that makes it look a bit better. Uh, I, you're probably not gonna see across the stream and with the recordings, but Anti-aliasing, it means the, it takes care of the jagged edges of the, of the things that you can see here, like on the edges of the model. And, and so these are just things that are nice to have, but it's good. So we have this, it's obviously mapped wrong and we're going to fix this in a minute. Uh, but first thing we might want to do is see in our material, same as our renderer and almost everything in 3JS. This also has parameters. So parameters of this can be, for example, a color. Now, the color format is a little bit weird in 3JS, but my suggestion is use zero X and then is basically RGB. So if we want to do, for example, a full red, it's gonna FF0000. This is like classic RGB color and you can pass it as a property in our, you know, it's extra. And as you can see now, because we allowed it to be transparent, we actually have our print on top of our texture. So instead of baking it all like we did with the um, robot, we're actually having a lot of information. We're deriving those information from the scene. So we made the lights and the lights are dynamic. And just for when, when I, what I mean, when 
uh, I say lights are dynamic. So if we do, uh, if we do, I think we can do this. So before the animate function, we just want to like we are creating those lights inside of this function. So the scope of those is inside here. So if we want to pull them out, we need to do no, not the ambient light. I think that the uh, light and we don't set it. And then instead of setting it inside here, we just do this. This allows us to reach for these objects even outside of this function. Because for example, in the, this is like things from the animation, we can comment those out. We can, what we can do is actually change the position, for example, with a, with a mouse position, because we were already calculating the mouse position. So see, right now we're changing the X position based on where the mouse is. And this starts to get pretty nice. We can do also the Y. We're actually fully controlling the lightning setup with the mouse, because we already had the mouse position calculated earlier, and those objects are actually dynamic. This type of thing we could not do with the baked in lights from the robot, for example. This is the advantage of having those lights inside of the scene. I think I'm going to leave it like this. It's kind of nice. This is good down and cool. Really cool. Good. So again, I think we can start to remove some stuff. I think probably before the next sessions, uh, my suggestion would be we, we should also reorganize code a bit. Now, right now we're already kind of tight with timings. But in general, I think, especially if since this project is going to grow and grow and grow and there's going to be way more things, I suggest we, we're going to actually leverage the file system and the imports and exports. We're going to talk about that in a minute. For now, we're just doing it in this single file. Because why not? So again, these are stuff that we used previously. That was the bone thing. This is the just, because it's going to make it a little bit easier to navigate for me. With the controls we can leave, I think, yeah, all the rest is good. We're going to delete stuff when we need to delete them. So we're adding lights. We're declaring those. What's I adding lights? But declaring them outside the function. So we can access them and drain them. Good. Then just leave comments. See if people are going to clone the repo. They're going to find those and might be better. So where are we? We have. A lightning setup that moves a lot, maybe a bit too much. We have a shirt where we actually have applied a texture, but we can play with the transparency of the texture and actually have full control over the color. And this is going to be another important thing because people are going to have the option to choose different colors for their product. So we want to be able to control the color uh, outside of it. So if we make it red and green, we're going to have a different color. So we actually have full control over this. The only thing that's left to do really is map the texture the proper way. So and this is what I mean by UV, and you're going to see this in a minute. So if I get back to Blender and we see this uh, mesh and the UVs that we were seeing, if we just, so if you open the shading tab, and you go into the material properties, you're going to see that right now, this is not really important, it's, it's just for show, but you can like add a texture. This is the same thing that's happening. So these are the UVs, and it's like, there's the same UVs that we are seeing and mapping the texture in browser. This is the mapping, and this is an image texture. So for example, if we go back on desktop and take the same print, what we should hopefully see is the same wrong print we are seeing um, the same wrong print we are seeing in the web version. So now what we should do, and if you look at this, you can also in Blender, you can open the same print as an overlay. So you can see like this is the mapping. And, and what I mean by mapping, and like this is the way uh, the texture is gonna be seen. Like if you can see the texture here, yeah, it's not gonna be too convenient to see, but like, I think I might zoom a little bit. See, if we move this map, we are actually moving where the print is positioned. Now, this is going to change when we actually do it with the actual prints and products in the store. But just for reference, what we want to find is 
the front, which is going to be this area, assuming we're going to place the print there. So what we can do in texture mapping is first thing, you select it all, whatever the UVs are, and you press S and point one, and you make it really, 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 really small. And you put, and you can probably go even smaller, and you put those things in a place where there's no prints. So we're basically telling the UVs that we don't want to be displayed here. So all the UVs for this texture now are now mapped to this white rectangle. So we're not going to be seeing any prints there. Next step is find where you actually want your print to be. Seems reasonable. And what you can do is you can take this and instead scale them really large to get to, and, and, and this we're going to adjust further, I think, because there's a couple of issues here. But in general, if you can see what's happening now, like this is flipped, but not to worry too much about this for now. So we're actually positioned the print where it should be. And this is the technique that we're going to use over and over again to place prints in the proper places. I see it's a bit weird position now. <laughs> like we, we have it, you know. What you do what if the texture is flipped is you scale on the Y axis by minus one. Nice. Okay, but no, you also scale okay. on the X axis, but minus one. Yeah. But want no. to, so this is good. We also want to recenter it correctly. And what you should see now Oh, yeah. Here's the print. Yeah. If you can see, we see some weird uh, things here because UVs wrap around. So this happens because this thing comes out of here and this thing comes out of here. But with coming out of here means actually it's getting back into here. So we're actually seeing the small bits of this because UVs are continuous, like they repeat themselves in all directions. So what do we want to do if we had to do this? Clean this up. We select those ones. We... Uh, I think, give me a second, we're just going to be doing this the proper way. <laughs> like, well, no, I don't think we should spend that much time right now on this. So you can just squeeze them and reposition those in places where they don't mess with our thing. So is it possible to tell, like, uh, in CSS, you can tell not repeat background? Is it possible in 3D? You can, but what happens with the texture is that the last pixel gets stretched infinitely. Right. It okay. does really weird um, things. I think we, 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 when we're actually going to be uh, implementing it in browser, and maybe if we get to talk about shaders, it might be interesting to actually discuss a little bit that because UVs are an extremely complex, but also fascinating topic. So where are we? We have our print. Now our, our mesh has correct UVs. And this is really important because if we now file export GLTF, remember we tick the remember export settings so we can re-export it on top. And the important thing is going to be that, uh, well, no, we include, so is auto ticked, so you don't really need to worry about this. Like UVs are always ticked. So you're actually exporting this. And this is like a big data file. Like it's really just a JavaScript array really roughly in terms of concept, but it, it's just for every point of the mesh, uh, there's a, a corresponding map to the uh, point in the UVs, basically. Again, we, we're going to talk more about this later. So I'm just exporting it on top of the other file. So I've renamed it to TXT. So you get back into the assets and where we had the previous file stored, what we want to do is drag this new file, which is the same shirt file with uh, after we've done our modification to the UVs. Now, hopefully, by just doing that, we should have our print back to the correct place. <laughs> so take the new link, copy this. I don't really know if I should publish or not, but I'm going to do it anyway. And for those um, people who does not understand why we're pushing those TXT files, please watch the previous series where we explained this trick, how to host models in Webflow. It's really neat and it's really handy. So we are going to swap for the new link and hopefully now it's really, really, really small. Why is it small? Is it because small? Because you made it small. 
Exactly. I made it. I made it the correct size, to be fair. But we still have at the thirteen here, so you can be get back to three, and with a properly sized model, this is going to be where it should be with the print in the correct place. I think also we were changing a little bit the size of the the position of the robot somewhere. I'm just yeah. See, no, this is correct. Uh, the light okay. The light no. Okay, we are. Oh yeah, we were previously moving the robot to minus one, and that's why it's so down. So now it's dead center. So this is actually our shirt with the print. There's a little bit of an artifact, again, because I did the UVs in a really bad way, but we're going to fix them eventually. On the 3D side of things, in this code right now, you already have all the things you need. We're just going to need to, instead of, for example, doing this thing, we might also want to rename it from robot, but Instead of doing it only once, we're going to see a little bit more what's happening inside of here. So when you actually traverse the model, we're going to find instead of just one thing, you're going to try, we're going to find all three of the models. And we're going to be able to reference then them procedurally with code as an array. So the first one goes to the right, the second one goes to the left. You can, we're going to position them in 3D space. We're going to give each one the same material. Well, not different, well, a material that works the same, but it's independent. We're going to reference a different texture. And instead of just adding a texture that we're selecting from the DOM, we're actually going to be able to, uh, with this texture, to uh, select them and like having them work when you're going to go to the through the browser art thing. You're going to be able to click on one of those and you're going to see the texture going onto the shirt or on the mag and on everything. I think there's still some functionality, like when you click on one graphic, do you want to switch them on old models and so on? But we're going to look at all this kind of thing during the integration part. Yeah, this is like yeah. a question to the art uh, of stuff. Like some prints might not work on a mag, which would work, you know, on a t-shirt and other yeah. way around. Like sometimes you want on a t-shirt really small logo, but you want big logo uh, on a cap. Yeah or you want to cover entire map with the logo. Uh, it also a question how you position stuff. Um, and probably this is why we would keep it uh, separately for every product. We would have like different yeah. uh, prints, but we will, we'll find the best way how to handle this uh, in CMS uh, because yeah, we exactly. build it eventually for the client. So clients would come and just you upload some images to CMS with editor and that's it. So he, he doesn't have to touch any 3D or stuff. He just like, you know, maybe he has some templates in uh, Photoshop or in Figma and he just like, you know, place the image here, uh, export, upload to CMS and it goes to production. So where a user can just like, you know, explore the products. We might actually make it in only three sessions. Yeah, it, it looks I, awesome. Even w we have this like controlling quiet one with mouth movements, which is like, you know, complimentary thing we didn't plan it. But yeah, this just happened. <laughs> it, it, it's awesome. Like, you know, it's cool. Hey guys, thank you for watching this episode. I hope you learned a lot about 3D and this is getting really, really well. We even have some complimentary stuff like the, that moving light which is super awesome and we're gonna have it on finsley store so thank you for watching this episode thank you for the Rico for explaining all the magic behind the 3d and i'm looking forward for two more episodes and then it's gonna be like complete really cool 3d store in webflow thank you guys thank you for the Rico. Yes, thank you so much, Ragai. Thank you again, Finsweet, for having me. I hope everyone likes the video and, and yeah, and this amazing project we're building together. So stay tuned for the next one.